what would the audience think? They paid so much money to come see this beautiful opera and to see the Queen of the Night sing the most famous aria probably in opera, and I'm giving it to the toilet before I give it to them. <laughs> Even though you may have never seen an opera or you have never even thought about going to an opera, you probably know the Queen of the Night's second aria. I think it was on a Volvo commercial. It's a wildly popular aria because it's so sort of like phantasmical. Is it, is it actually as easy as it looks? I have performed the Queen of the Night over 300 times worldwide. Here at the Metropolitan Opera, I hold the record for most times singing Queen of the Night in company history. On June 3rd, I'll sing my 50th performance here at the Met of Queen of the Night. It's a different magic flute than you've done. Oh, yes. Usually when I walk through these doors, I have this giant costume on that I have to be really careful not to hit against anything, and it's like flags and everything. And this time, you'll see in a few minutes after I get my makeup done, I'm this little haggard old woman. So it's a really wildly different take on this opera. I think it's one of the best things about Mozart's Magic Flute is that it's, a, it's such a malleable storyline because it's so fairy tale based. Going into Simon McBurney's interpretation, which is very dark and psychological, I think of it much more like a psychological thriller. This is the backstage. Well, come with me. It's kind of amazing, it's never lost on me how many amazing singers have walked this same walk that I'm walking right now. It just, it seriously never gets old for me. So this is a really interesting set. Usually these curtains are not here, but there's no curtains in the wings for this production. We have to like kind of close off the sides so that there's at least like a little bit of area where the artists can come and go for their entrances. So this is really like a stage built on top of a stage. We have this giant platform here on the stage. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it is tremendously complicated. The stagehand crew is, uh, I think around, some total around 200 people. Our production of Desauberflaut, we have a center platform that we fly connected to four 2,000 pound capacity winches. This show in general is probably one of the more technically sophisticated shows that the Met has undertaken. It seems very simple because it, there's a platform and there's an overhead structure, and that's kind of what I think the audience sees. There's so much else behind it, right? Right now in the grid, they're testing, uh, we have two performer flight winches that are used to pick up Papageno and Papagena. We do what we call a bag test, where we hook one of these big sandbags to the line. That is how we sort of like vet the flight for the day. I believe we have as many as six people on it at any given time when it's in motion. And when it's a static, we, I think we have as many as like a dozen. The software kind of allows us to manipulate it in any way, whatever angle we choose and, and stuff like that. So everything kind of maintains tension. Our technical department pieced together information about where the platform was during each queue. And we're able to run through all the video elements and audio elements add a significant amount of complexity to the show that I think that's where we're sort of trending, it seems. But it's, it's very different than say like La Boheme. The Magic Flute is a wildly popular opera that you, you see it being performed all the time. People like to go see it as their first opera. Many people even outside of the opera lover community still know about the Magic Flute just like they've heard of La Boheme and they've heard of La Traviata. There's always a lot of curiosity, it's just like a giant operation. Our day sort of starts between like 8 and 9 a.m. At that point we start getting ready for our morning rehearsals right now. That's Desire Flout. Next week it's going to be uh, Hollander. Getting the show set first of all and then testing all of our machinery. After the rehearsal we then break that down into a completely different set, whatever the uh, performance is that night. That can either be really easy or that can be uh, dramatic. Like if we're going Don Giovanni into Hollander, that's a very big change. Here at the Met we have about an average of two or three shows a week. So it's very different than the music theater world. It's a really different kind of singing and we're not amplified, so it's much more taxing to the voice. But they said, you know, Katie, you just make it look so easy. How do you do it? Is it, is it actually as easy as it looks? And I'm like, no, it really is not. Like, I'm so happy that it doesn't look hard, I guess, but it's nerve wracking every time. Other roles that I've sung, 
I definitely do not get as nervous. Roles like Lucia, roles like Violetta. With the Queen of the Night, it's a different beast. I have to go back out after sitting in my dressing room for an hour to an hour and a half and gear up all of that energy for the most famous rage aria in all of opera history. It, it's just really, that is a major challenge on any given night, but the last five years have really uh, taught me what exhaustion really is. The most embarrassing thing that I do is I literally, I have a bathroom right, right around the corner in my dressing room, and that's the only hard surfaces I have in here. So I literally go and like sing into the toilet. That is my pre-show ritual. I've been singing at the Met for nearly 10 years now. I made my debut singing Queen of the Night also. I came here first when I was 10. My mom woke me up at 5 a.m. and she said, do you want to go to school today or do you want to go to New York City and see an opera with me? And I said, uh, dumb question, definitely skipping school. So we had this great weekend and I came here and you'd think maybe a 10 year old wouldn't be into it, you know, but it wasn't, it, it solidified for me. It's just remember that really as being my first introduction to opera and this place, this place is just so amazing. Every time I walk into this space, it brings me back and, and remembering that those chandeliers, they, they're down further before the show and then just before the show begins, they raise up into the ceiling and that's how you know the show's about to start.